Hi, I'm Rick Schwartzwelder, the writer-director of The Least of These. What you're about to see is an interview I had with Dr. Anthony Campolo. For those of you that don't know, Tony is a sociologist, college professor, preacher. He's also the originator of The Agnes Story, and it was The Agnes Story that served as the inspiration for our short film. We thought it might be interesting for you to get a peek inside the mind that actually gave birth to our story. Now, if you've never heard Tony speak before, buckle up. Not all of you are going to agree with everything that Tony has to say. In fact, some of you may strongly disagree. But whether you agree with Tony or disagree with Tony, it's quickly going to become apparent that it is virtually impossible to ignore Tony. First of all, there's that great line by Einstein that imagination is more important than knowledge. What people imagine really enables them to think through issues, look for solutions to problems, grab hold of truths that otherwise would elude them. When you tell a story, you get people to use their imagination. They begin to picture the whole thing taking place. It's no surprise that Jesus did most of his teaching by telling stories getting people to imagine things in their eyes. You're looking for the speck in your brother's eyes, you got a two by four beam in your own. You, you can't help but just picture the whole thing. Um, Jesus over and over again used stories because it really captured people's imagination. And the accumulation of facts and information have very little effect on us. But when it's wrapped up in a story and they see how all of this stuff works out in a real life situation, it impacts them powerfully. They're a sociologist. Um, I, I, I could cite, for instance, uh, one particular one, Marshall McLuhan, who would argue that a culture is nothing more than the sum total of its stories. That uh, if you want to understand a culture, you have to get all the folk stories uh, that uh, exist in that culture. Right now, we have a missionary team working in Haiti, and they're collecting Haitian stories because the country is being so inundated by American television that they are losing their Haitian culture. And they want to keep these stories alive because the stories of a culture, in a real sense, incarnate the culture, communicate the values of the culture. Stories are the instrument through which the old share their values with the young. Stories are the means whereby that which is essentially true is communicated to the next generation. It's interesting. When Jesus has his head anointed by oil, Judas goes off saying, we could have sold the thing and given the money to the poor, yada, yada, yada. And Jesus says, wherever my story is told. Note, not my message, my story is told. This story will be part of it. Uh, that he recognizes that it's a story. My own family is Italian. And uh, what Italians do at dinner is they sit around the table and tell story after story after story about when you were young, when you did this, when you did that. We rehearse the whole family story. I get married. My wife becomes part of the dinners. I still remember the day when into the total story of the family, because we tell the same stories over and over again, suddenly interspersed was a story about Peggy, my wife. And I knew now that she was accepted into the family because she was part of the story. Well, obviously, I look for a story that really gives expression to some great truth. Like this story of Agnes really communicates what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about and what Christianity is all about. People who have questions about the Christian faith, who question the doctrines, who are not sure who Jesus is, when you tell that story, they say, if that's what Christianity is, then I'm with it, do you see? You capture a great truth. The other thing is that I look for a story that not only captures a great truth, but either makes you laugh or cry. I'll settle for either one of them. When a storyteller or a filmmaker unabashedly goes for the heart of an audience, scattered cries of sentimentalism or charges of emotional manipulation usually pop up somewhere. The least of these is no stranger to this reaction on occasion, nor is the Agnes story.
Of course I'm being manipulative and sentimental. I accept that. I am trying to get people to take seriously who Jesus is. I'm trying to get people uh, to, to, to take the gospel message and apply it to their lives. And yes, why do you, why do you have to use the word manipulation? It's, it's salesmanship. I'm trying to get people to buy a product and I tell a story. Tell, turn on the television set. Every single ad is built around a mini story, a little cute story. Uh, people in the car going on a picnic, people are doing this, doing, they're trying to get you to get, take the product seriously. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. When they come on and say, but you're appealing to people's emotions, especially that laughing and crying stuff. You're of course I'm appealing to people's emotions. I got to tell you this, I'm a sociologist by trade. People are more controlled by their emotions than anything else. That in the end, we make decisions emotionally and then we rationally look for justification for what we decided to do and be because of emotional reasons. Everything that we do is guided by emotions. We get married for emotional reasons. We, we have children for emotional reasons. And when we ultimately have to face death, we do it with deep emotions. The only question is, what emotions will be evident in those hours? And will they be constructive emotions or destructive emotions? I believe that we need to be not less emotional, but even more emotional. Soren Kierkegaard once said, this age will die, speaking of the generation to come, our age, not because of sin, but from lack of passion. Whoa, that's heavy. Lack of passion. There's nothing worse to me than people without passion. In producing the least of these, we made several minor adjustments to Tony's original story. One of them was changing the name of the central prostitute from Agnes to Shannon. Knowing that Tony had used the name Agnes for his story, and that it wasn't the name of the real prostitute, I always wondered why he picked it. Why that name? Why Agnes? When I was in high school, there was a senior prom. It's a good story in itself. I was president of the student body. And I found out that one of the jobs was to run a dance once a year. So I had to set up this dance. I'm a Baptist, we don't dance. But I knew my job, and I set up the dance. But I wasn't going to dance. I set it up for everybody else. And we got there about 7 o'clock and decorated the place and got the guy with the records. And I came, the story's a long story, with about 15 points to it, but I'll just pick one. But I wasn't dancing. I was sitting on the side with the school chaperone, and I looked around. And the chaperone said to me, oh, it's a great party. Everybody's having such a good time. And I looked across the room, and here were these four girls. And one of them was this girl, Agnes, who was my lab partner. A bright, witty, with it girl. But she had lousy legs. And our society rejects people like that. And I remember and the thing was over, being out on the sidewalk of the high school, 
inner city school in Philadelphia. And Agnes, this fun person, I mean, she was humorous, she was witty, comes running out of the school, ran right by me. I said, hi. She didn't answer. She never ignored people before. Jumped into a waiting car where her father was, and she started to cry. I went in to see the principal the next day and said, I'm never running one of those things again. And he said, you're letting your Baptist fundamentalism. I said, that's not the point. I said, my pastor doesn't know what's wrong with the dance. What's wrong with a school dance is that it hurts people. And I saw a friend get hurt last night. And I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. Whenever I think of a girl who's been hurt by the system, the name Agnes comes to the fore. So here was a girl, a woman now, who's hurt by the system. Obviously, the connection is Agnes. And the reason why I choose the name is because when I tell a story, I want to get emotionally involved. And what I bring to the story when I use the name Agnes is all the emotions that swelled up inside of me as I watched her dissolve in tears as she sat in the car and drove away. All those feelings come back. In communication, it's not enough just to say the right words. The emotion has got to be there. The passion has got to be there. And the name Agnes generates a conditioned response. At most film festivals, the screening of a film is typically followed by a question and answer session with the filmmaker. Following festival screenings of the least of these, the one question I was asked more than any other was, what happened next? Audiences wanted to know where did Shannon go with the cake? Did she ever bring it back? What happened to the rest of the people in the diner? And what did happen to Shannon, to Agnes? Agnes gave up the life, quote unquote, shortly after that event and went to work at the diner. And they turned that diner into a place where people come for help day and night. The word is around town. If you're in trouble, go to the diner. The people there will talk to you, listen to you, and help you if they can. After that particular event, I was in uh, Linfield College in uh, Oregon to speak to one of these spiritual vision weeks, a kind of be kind to God week on church college campus. And it's an American Baptist school that's kind of related to Jesus somewhere. At any rate, I came out, it was February 25th. It's easy to remember the date because that's my birthday. I came out onto the platform to deliver this lecture, the sociological lecture. The place is decorated with balloons and, and, and streamers. And I came up to the pulpit and here was a sign on the pulpit that said, Happy birthday, Tony. Now, it's not really her name, Agnes. Happy birth, uh, but I'll use her name, fictitious name again. Happy birthday, Tony. Agnes, your friend from Honolulu. She had somehow found out when my birthday was, where I would be on my birthday, and contacted some students at the college and had them set this up for me. It says a lot of good things. First of all, it says something about prostitutes. It says you can't judge people superficially. Agnes, I make a really strong point in telling the story when I tell it personally. Agnes is one of the good people. She's kind, she's thoughtful, and when all the other prostitutes show up, it's because she's been so good and she's been so kind. When I prayed for her, I prayed that God would deliver her from what dirty, filthy men had done to her, making a second point that every sociologist knows, that generally a prostitute is somebody who got messed over at the age of 10 or 11 or 12, that she is not an evil person, she is a victim. When I tell the story and I uh, say, uh, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning, and people laugh, it sets me up for the line. That's exactly the kind of church that Jesus came to create. And I always add, I don't know where we got this other one that's half country club. 
down deep inside, everybody knows that's true. Great preaching does not give a new truth. It simply uncovers things that we already believe and brings them to the surface so that we say, yeah, that's right, that's what I think. And when I tell that story and I say, that's the kind of church that Jesus came to create, everybody says, he's right, he's absolutely right. And then when you add, I don't know where we've got this other one that's half country club, they're all saying, that's true too. Our church isn't doing what Jesus wants it to do. So there's another truth that's there. And then, of course, the response of Harry is, no, you don't. No, you don't. I would join a church like that. Wouldn't we all? Well, tell us about it, kid. You the uh, holy roller type or more the starch in the collar? What kind of church is it you belong to? The kind that throws birthday parties for whores at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, well, hallelujah. Is that right? There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Too bad. Yeah. If it did, I might join it. There's about eight solid lessons. When Jesus tells one of his parables, you don't get one point. You can go back and preach the parables of Jesus over and over again because there's layers of truth to be uncovered as you tell the story. A good story, like the story about Agnes, which I consider to be a good story, has all kinds of truths buried there. One of the most surprising things about the least of these is its appeal to such diverse audiences. From those that see the film merely as a tender slice of life, to others who see it more as a critique of organized religion, to those that see the film primarily as an affirmation of the impact personal faith can have on community. Opinion swings from one extreme to the other. Tony's comments regarding the Agnes story and our film often speak most directly to members of the religious community. Since I suspect that at least some of you watching may not define yourselves as members of that community, I asked Tony to share some thoughts on his story's unique crossover appeal and what he believes that he and Agnes have to say to those who don't necessarily buy into his worldview or theology. The reason why it clicks is very simple. It does what Jesus does. It takes Christianity outside of a religious institution. We're no longer in a church. We're no longer in a religious environment. Once you get the truth of God out of the church, out of the stranglehold of institutionalized religion, and come up with its bare realities and its impact of loving care, it rings true to people. I find that people don't reject Jesus. They reject the religious institution that is presenting Jesus and throw out Jesus with the institution. If you can just get Jesus out of the institution into the real world situations, if you can just get rid of the trappings. Jesus did that in his day. He took the truths of the Torah, of the Jewish Bible, if you go over the teachings of Jesus, you'll find that they're all in the Torah, they're all in the Old Testament. He quotes often from the book of Deuteronomy. But he takes all of that stuff out of the religious institutions and puts it on the street where people live. When that happens, everybody says, yes, because they agree with the truth. They do not agree that these institutional structures that have hidden the truth that smother the truth, that are into a lot of money-making, are valid. Remove Jesus from the church and people buy him. I go to 1 John, where the writer writes these words, and this cuts it right down to the bottom line. God is love. No, not the institution, not the theology. God is love. We all know that verse. I don't think many people know the words that come immediately after that. And whosoever loveth is born of God. And there is a sense when I tell that story that all those prostitutes who showed up that night 
and Harry and Jan, who ran the diner, that they all were expressing the love of God. Now, you can say, yes, but do they theologically agree with this doctrine or that doctrine or the other doctrine? God is love, and whosoever loveth is born of God. And that's what I would like everybody to carry away. There's a man in the church who's a deacon, and uh, he's one of those deacons that doesn't deek, you know. I mean, uh, every church has deacons that don't deek, and this was one of them. And uh, he goes to this guy, he says, you know, you don't do anything around here. Could you at least drive the van that takes the youth group to the old folks' home when they put on the worship service once a month? So the guy agrees, and the first week he goes. Standing in the back while the kids are doing their thing up front, this uh, old man in a wheelchair rolls his wheelchair over. The guy's obviously senile, grabs the deacon's hand and holds it. All during the service, he holds it. The same situation repeats itself the following week, or should I say the following month when they go, and then the month after that, and the month after that. And then they go back, and the guy's not there. The deacon asked about him, and he said, oh, he's dying. He's not going to live out the week, probably not the night. He's down in the, down the hall about four doors. Guy goes down, here are the tubes and the electronic things all over in the sky lying there with his mouth open, obviously unconscious. He grabs the old guy's hand and prays that the Lord would deliver him from this life into the next, painlessly and gloriously, to life everlasting in heaven. When he finishes the prayer, the seemingly unconscious man squeezes the deacon's hand very tightly, and he knows that the prayer was heard. He's so moved by this that tears welled up in his eyes, and as he's stumbling out of the room, he bumps into this middle-aged woman who says, I'm, I'm his daughter. He's been waiting for you. The deacon said, for me? He said, for you. He said he didn't want to die until he had the chance to hold the hand of Jesus one more time. I kept on telling him that in the next life he would have a chance to hold the hand of Jesus. He said, oh no, in this life you get to hold the hand of Jesus. Once a month Jesus comes and holds my hand, and I don't want to die until I have a chance to hold the hand of Jesus one more time. And in telling that story, I always say, I don't know what you think Christianity is about, but it is ultimately about this that you become Jesus for somebody.